What does the papacy so carefully conceal beneath their puffy dresses and tall tiaras? Let's dive into these murky waters for a moment. In tradition, the Pope stands as the head of the Roman Catholic Church, a beacon of spiritual guidance and leadership. Yet this role comes with its fair share of controversy and debate, primarily surrounding the concept of the Pope as a mediator between God and humanity. The answer lies in interpretation and understanding. The Pope, in his role, does not claim to be a divine entity or a conduit for God's voice. Instead, he is seen as a spiritual guide, someone who can aid followers in understanding and interpreting God's word. This is a critical distinction, one that often gets blurred in the discourse surrounding the papacy. However, the crux of the matter is not only the role of the Pope as a mediator, it is about the power, the authority that this strange figure possesses. The Pope is not just a spiritual leader, he is the leader of a large part of the world's Christian population. This leadership role, combined with his supposed mediating function, often raises questions and criticism. Chi pravo no shchobodna liudina malataki vaplivnad nad milionami liude povisomus vitu? Chi ne superechit se fundamental nomu principu priamix to sunkiv kojnoi liudini is bogum bez pozorednikiv si pitania lunayut protiagom stolit viklikayuchi discusi ita superechki? So we return to our original question. What does the Pope really represent in the landscape of Christianity? Is he really a spiritual leader? Is he a guide, a mentor? Is the Pope a divine mediator? This is a title that perhaps needs to be re-examined. So what role does the Pope play and whom does he really serve? Can we view the papacy as an embodiment of medieval rituals? This question invites us to delve deeper into the practices of the papacy and scrutinize their roots. Some argue that the rituals and customs of the papacy bear a striking resemblance to paganism and witchcraft rather than falling in line with biblical teachings. This viewpoint, albeit controversial, is worth exploring in our quest to understand the true essence of Christianity. Consider for a moment the elaborate ceremonies, the opulent attire, the incense, and the rituals that form a part of the papal liturgy. Do they not in some way echo the mystic practices of pagan and witchcraft traditions? Such rituals are not explicitly mentioned in the Bible, leading some to question their place within the Christian faith. The contrast between these practices and the foundational principles of Christianity is stark. The Bible, the cornerstone of Christianity, emphasizes a personal relationship with God devoid of intermediaries. It advocates for simplicity, humility, and direct communion with the divine. Yet the rituals and customs of the papacy seem to be a departure from these principles. They introduce a layer of complexity and mediation that many believe dilutes the essence of the Christian faith and hinders man's relationship with his divine nature and God. The papacy violates the main principle of man's faith in his creator, that is, a newly created, unnatural, and strange papal institution sits on the divine leadership of the human creator. What does it want from us, the people? Despite the controversy and the history of the papacy, which is stained with the blood of millions of innocents, the papacy still plays a significant role in the spiritual and political life of society. But it's important to remember that faith is a personal journey, and one must always be open to questioning and understanding different perspectives. Let us return to the previous question. Do the rituals used in Christianity have any divine basis? I want to discuss this, but I'll tell you, no. There is not a single hint of infant baptism, the Eucharist, weddings, funerals, and all the things that are done in the church in the Bible, because only the Bible is considered to be divinely inspired. So where did everything we see in Christian services come from? After all, faith is not a destination, but a journey of understanding and discovery. Is the papacy an institution of faith or a center of totalitarianism? Let's dig deeper into this question. The papacy for centuries has been the fulcrum of the Catholic Church, wielding power and influence over millions. Yet some critics argue that the papacy represents a form of religious totalitarianism where an individual or a group exercises absolute control over others, often justified by religious doctrine. In a totalitarian regime, the authority is not questioned. This is eerily similar to the papacy, where the Pope is considered infallible in matters of faith and morals. This infallibility, critics argue, has been used as a tool of power and control rather than a symbol of spiritual guidance. The Pope's words are not just guidelines, they are absolute decrees that must be obeyed, blurring the line between spiritual leadership and autocratic rule. 
Moreover, the Vatican, the seat of the papacy, operates much like a sovereign state with its own laws, governance, and diplomatic relations. Isn't it peculiar for a spiritual institution to have such political power? Critics argue that this dual role often leads to the politicization of the papacy, obscuring the spiritual mission it is supposed to uphold. This criticism is further amplified by the historical context. The history of the papacy is marred with power struggles, corruption, and scandals, a far cry from the spiritual purity one might expect. Critics argue that these historical realities reflect the true nature of the papacy, a political institution masked under a veil of faith. Of course, the papacy is not only about criticism and controversy. For many, it is a beacon of faith, a guiding light in a world riddled with uncertainty. Nevertheless, it is very important to question and be vigilant to ensure that your faith, that is, your relationship with the Creator, is not used for power and control over your soul, your spiritual resources, your psyche. After all, a person is a decision and an action. Not only the life of your body, health, and beauty, but also the life of your soul depends on your choice. So is the papacy more a political institution than a spiritual one? Perhaps it's not a black and white answer, but one thing is certain. This question warrants thoughtful consideration and discourse. Does the papacy uphold the Christian concept of sin and redemption? This is a question worth pondering as the papacy's interpretation of sin and redemption has been a point of contention for centuries. In the heart of the Christian doctrine, the concept of sin is seen as a transgression, a deviation from the divine law. It is a personal misstep that hinders our relationship with God and redemption is the process of rectifying this. In essence, it is believed that we learn and grow spiritually by recognizing our sins, seeking forgiveness and striving to avoid repeating these mistakes. Here's where the controversy brews. The papacy, some argue, promotes a skewed interpretation of this concept, suggesting that the sins of others can be redeemed by a third party. This perspective essentially posits that an individual can bear the sins of another, which is a notion that seems to contradict the personal nature of sin and redemption as outlined in the Bible. The Bible essentially emphasizes the idea of personal responsibility for one's actions. It teaches that each person is responsible for his or her own sins and must seek to correct mistakes on his or her own. For example, the Bible describes the principle of dealing with mistakes as follows. If you have done something wrong, don't do it again. When you offer a sacrifice to God and remember that you had a quarrel with your neighbor, you should first go and reconcile with the person and God will listen to you. In other words, the key to a good relationship with God is the ability to gain positive experience in relationships with people. From the point of view of psychology, the Bible is a psychological treatise that accurately describes the workings of the human psyche and the criteria for a successful life. This differs significantly from the point of view of the papacy, which seems to advocate a form of vicarious redemption. This interpretation is not only controversial, but also potentially damaging. It could encourage complacency and a lack of personal responsibility among believers who might be led to believe that their sins can simply be taken care of by someone else. Furthermore, this view seems to dilute the deep spiritual growth that comes with the process of confessing one's sins, seeking forgiveness, and working on personal improvement. So, where does this leave us? It raises the question, could the papacy be promoting a distorted interpretation of sin and redemption? This is a debate that continues to stir conversations among theologians, scholars, and believers alike, challenging the very core of what we understand about sin, redemption, and the role of the papacy in interpreting these concepts. Is it time for Christianity and the papacy to evolve or be abandoned? This is a question that has been echoing in the halls of religious discourse for some time now. As we traverse the 21st century, entrenched institutions and age-old beliefs face a crossroads and none more so than Christianity and its central figure, the Pope. The argument is not that faith in a higher power is obsolete, rather it's the antiquated structures and doctrines like the papacy, which seem to be at odds with a rapidly changing progressive society. The world today values individuality, empowerment, and personal growth. Yet the papacy, with its medieval rituals and hierarchical structure, seems to demand the opposite, blind obedience and submission. The call for a shift is not to abandon faith, 
but to reimagine it in a way that aligns with the values of our time. It's about embracing a spirituality that encourages self-development, self-discovery, and righteousness, rather than adherence to a prescribed set of rules. A spirituality that is not about following, but about leading oneself towards becoming a better individual. The concept of sin, for instance, can be reinterpreted not as a divine transgression requiring penance, but as a personal mistake from which we can learn and grow. We are, after all, human. And being human means making mistakes, learning from them, and moving forward. A process that doesn't necessitate a divine mediator. Critics argue that the papacy, with its history of scandals and controversies, has strayed far from these ideals. They assert that the institution has been co-opted by individuals with unsatisfied egos and an excessive thirst for power, who have taken up residence in the temple of God and are pretending to be God. In this light, it becomes clear that the future of spirituality may lie beyond the traditional confines of Christianity and the papacy. It may lie in a space where faith is personal, where it encourages self-improvement, where it is not about following but about leading. It may lie in a space where we are not just believers but seekers, seekers of truth, of growth, and of righteousness. Can the future of spirituality lie outside the traditional boundaries of Christianity and the papacy? Of course.